You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, powered by Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. Cornerstone is the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource with over 160 instructional videos, including everything that you need to take a seven week old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com to sign up for their free preview module and begin your journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 122. This week on the show, we welcome Barton Ramsey, Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy in Southern Oak Kennels, to talk with us about how his season went, what he's up to now, and most importantly, how to transition your dog from hunting season mode to training mode. All right, welcome to this, the 122nd episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Palm, and we're your on-demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting. You can find our show... Wherever you can find quality podcast content, you can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you're a Facebook guy, head over to our listeners group and uh, request access over there and enjoy a lot of discussion with a lot of like-minded hunters, and including my co-host, Dan Harushka. Dan, what's up? So ruddy ducks produce the largest eggs relative to their body size of any duck, and a clutch of ruddy duck eggs can weigh more than the hen that laid them. That's pretty neat. That's that doesn't sound neat at all. That sounds like <laughs> pretty crazy. Also, I had this discussion with um someone at work, but do you know and I actually fact checked this and there's two there's two answers. I guess it depends on temperature, but <laughs> how how much snow does 1 inch of rain equal? Uh I want to say it's like 4 or 5 inches. Like four or five inches of rain, or I'm sorry, like one inch of snow would be, I'm sorry, one inch of rain <laughs> would be like four or five inches of snow. Okay. So on average, just because um, some's really fluffy, some's really wet, on average, one inch of rain equals 13 inches of snow. Oh. But if you're at 30 degrees, it would be at 10 inches of snow. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know about so I had that. To fact, I fact checked it because I'm awful. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I'm still not sure I believe that, but that's a lot of that's a that's a ton of snow. But anyway, uh, well, before uh, we get inch well, of rain's a lot of rain. It is, but we get inches of rain like on the regular this year. I mean, this has been a really wet year. I mean, we've had tons of rain. Right. I don't well, know. Well, be th- be thankful it's not snow. My God. <laughs> Also thankful for Yukonuba. Out in the field, how you've prepared determines how you'll perform. With balanced fat and protein to support peak condition, Yukonuba premium performance dog food enhances strength, energy, and endurance. So when the pavement ends and the truck doors finally swing open, you and your dogs are ready for anything. Strong focused, ready for anything, that's a Yukonuba dog. Also thankful for Gunner Kennel is engineered for your dog, designed for travel, and built for your peace of mind. The G1 Kennel has set the new industry standard and put Gunner Kennels in a category all its own. Gunner was started to protect your pet, and it continues to be at the center of everything that they do. Gunner is dedicated to building the best and safest pet travel crate on the market because man's best friend deserves man's best kennel. Check out their G1 series of kennels and accessories at GunnerKennels.com. All right, Dan. So this week we got Barton Ramsey on the show, and uh, this is an interview that um, you did because uh, it was kind of a midday spot for us. We had a lot going on this week, kind of scheduling-wise, and I wasn't able to make it. So you and Barton got on the horn for a little while and talked a little bit about his season and kind of what he's up to now and sort of how to transition your dog, you know, kind of from hunting mode into training mode again and, and all that good stuff. So we'll dive into that and, um, yeah, certainly cover that. But before we do, we wanted to hit a few things that we got going on that are kind of important. And I think probably first thing to start is, uh, I believe you referenced this last week, but we officially have our, uh, our hunt giveaway with, Big Kansas Outdoors and 737 uh, calls underway so people can head over to Instagram. And what's the deal, Dan? What do they got to do on that Instagram post to be able to get entered? Uh, you have to follow three, well, follow HP Outdoors, 
at Big Kansas Outdoors and at 737 Duck Calls. And then each time you tag a person, that's an entry. So tag away and make sure you follow everyone. And then we will pick someone um, beginning of March. Yep. And it makes it's, it, it works in your favor to put every tag as a separate post. So if you've tagged like 10 people on one post, tag them all individually. That way, you're, you know, we can track it a little easier. It makes it a lot easier for us. Yep. So it behooves you to do it that way. Um, so that's cool. Got that going on. Super excited about that. And we've also got a, a snow goose hunt coming up here in the very near future. Yeah, man. Heading down to Arkansas on the on the deck outfitters and man, it's just everyone you talk to. There's some people that are putting birds down and there's some people that are, you know, they're adults. They're very difficult to to kill and uh, you know, just so weary. So we'll see what we get into. There's a, a nice size group of us going down and, and listeners of this show. So it's gonna be a fun time, no matter what. Yeah, I think we filled that hunt with listeners from our listeners group over on Facebook. And, right. you know, again, it's hunting, right? I mean, we may not, we may go down there and not pull the trigger. I don't know. But what I do know is we'll be in camp with good folks and good times will be had regardless. But I mean, I'm definitely nervous, you know, I mean, everywhere you look and everyone you want to talk to is saying how, how hard it's been. And you hear people saying, oh, I'm skipping my hunt this year. I'm not going down to chase them and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's one of those things that makes it a little harder to manage expectation and excitement for the hunt. You know, it's like most of the time in this situation, you're thinking I'm going to go there and lay the wood to some birds. And, uh, you know, probably for the first time in my life, I'm going into this hunt saying, oh, I hope I pull the trigger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going Well, and you know, the, that big championship snow goose hunt that went on, yeah. uh-huh. you know, there were a lot of uh, goose eggs that got put up on that board. Absolutely. And, and it's just funny that the people that thought outside the box, small spread over water instead of thousands of decoys in a field, they they took home the big numbers and yeah they won the championship. So yeah, and I think that's the thing. I think people are killing birds in, um, but just you know you're not getting those hundred fifty day piles like you you know might typically get. So right. you know, I mean, if we go down and shoot twenty or thirty or whatever. I, you know, I'm not going to complain about that, but, um, you know, if we ended up lucking into a day where we get a big number like that, it'd be awesome. It'd be amazing. But you know, this, you know, my expectations are not that high for that type of hunt, but who knows? We'll, we, we'll, we'll see. And I just find it very interesting that this year, um, you know, we're getting ready to do this and, and we're talking about the adults and all that kind of stuff. And it's like everywhere you turn around, everybody wants to be arguing about season dates and migration patterns and this, that and hatch and all the other thing. It just feels like it's a very uh, polarizing time in that world of the, of the waterfowling space. So just, I don't know if it's an irony that I feel with this or what it is, but it just got me feeling some kind of way. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't, my expectations are very low down there. I think, you know, if we end up, because we're hunting, what, the three days? Yeah. You know, uh, and the one guy from our Delta banquet went down there, and I think he killed like eight or nine birds for the couple days he was down there. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, if we shoot 10 a day, so be it. If we don't pull trigger, then, and they outsmart us and land way out, then whatever. We'll try and come up with something creative. Yep. It'll be, it'll, it'll be, I can know, I can tell you for sure. It'll be better than sitting at work. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we got that going for us, but yeah. Anyway, you know, you can't kill them at home. Yeah, you cannot. Um, last night we had our Delta banquet. Yeah. And I mean, that's the most, that's, that was the most publicized Delta banquet in the history of Delta banquets in our group. I mean, for the yep. last for the last two weeks, everybody <laughs> knew that there was a ticket available still, just peppering well, us. We did we did sell out, and um, it was the highest highest purse of uh, of the chapter. So it was the most most they've ever made, most we've ever made. And what was you know, your was, highest? Uh, what was your highest grossing auction item? Uh, the gun of the year went for I think nineteen fifty or something. Nice. Now, did yeah. you do that all live auction, or did you guys do silent auction too? There's man, there were 
<clears throat> there were, I don't know how many items, but there was a live auction. There was the, um, the silent auction. There were a women's table that, you know, the, the hall that we were in. So, yeah. I mean, the women's, <laughs> women's tables had baskets along the whole stretch of one side of that. And then the other side were filled up with all like decoys. And I mean, it, there was so much stuff. And then we had the key game, the, um, the call game, all kinds of, all kinds of stuff going on. We had yeah. our tree set up and it was just, it, it went really, really well, That's better good. than, better than anyone expected. So, um, I don't know. Next year we might, might have to get a different venue to, to hold more people, but it was, it was awesome. Wow. That's awesome. That's glad. I'm glad to hear that. And it's, yep. it's, it's, I'm, I'm glad to hear that mainly because that, that's an area that at one, at one point in time was very, um, very supportive of a lot of the waterfowl community and had a lot of engagement and, you know, that a lot of that had been lost over the, over time. So mm -hmm. it feels like there's been a little bit of a resurgence there, which is, which is great. And, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm happy to see, see you guys having success. I, I like hearing success stories about, uh, banquets. Cause I think w one thing that a lot of people don't understand, if you've never been part of a Delta or a DU banquet, it's a ton of work to go around and hustle and get the donations and, you know, get the things that you need to be able to serve beer and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of people to, to work on those. And, you know, you hear people that come away from those underwhelmed or, you know, not hitting goals that they set. And it, it, it sucks. You know, I feel bad for those because a lot of work goes into it. So to hear that you guys exceeded expectation is awesome. I know that that feels really good. Yep. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure. I think like a low, a low number, what they thought we'd bring in would be like mid twenties. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're not in a big area whatsoever. So, I mean, not right. a ton of money around here. Um, our regional thought, he goes, I'm kind of, he goes, I'm really proud of what you guys put together. He goes, if he goes, we might touch 30 tonight. And he was like charged up about hitting that number possibly. And we ended up going over that by a few grand. So, yeah. um, it was, it was really cool. Sweet. That's awesome. Nice work. Well done. Yes, sir. All right, man. So what do you think? You want to jump into this, uh, interview with Barton? Yeah, and like you said, it was a, uh, a a lunchtime interview. If anyone follows Barton, which I'm sure a lot of our listeners do, the dude's been on the road for I don't know how many months in a row. It just seems like he's always traveling. So pinned him down for a lunchtime interview as he was on his way back to the airport and uh, and got a little chat in. Yeah, that's good. So let's go ahead and jump into that. Um, I do want to just give you all a heads up. There was a slight technical difficulty during the interview where there's uh, twice during the interview, the call waiting beeps come through. So and when you hear the beeping in the interview, don't think that like something in your truck is getting ready to explode or anything like that. It's just uh, the call waiting. That, that was, um, that <laughs> that was my through. bad. It's like, it's like when... Uh my cricket episodes when yeah, everyone yeah. thinks there's a cricket in your truck. So we got to, no we got we to leave, leave a little room for Dan's technical errors. Here, here, here <laughs> again. <laughs> but no, uh, other than that, the interview is great, good, solid quality. So uh, let's go ahead and roll that and we'll uh, circle back on the other side. So without further ado, here we go. Barton Ramsey, Southern Oak Kennels and Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. All right. And again, we are talking with Mr. Barton Ramsey. The listeners hear you every other week with the Yukonuva tips, but it's good to have you back on, man. How you doing? I'm doing well. I, uh, I've been home two days from my final waterfowl trip of the season, and I'm a little sad it's over, but I'm also a little relieved that no more traveling for a little bit uh, and a little bit of a, a break and a little more waking up in my own bed, so glad to be home. I was going to say, how was uh, how was your Valentine's Day? Because I hope you treated your wife right. I know that you. I did. You've been gone. I treated a while. her. You know, we have four kids, and we're kind of at that stage where, honestly, the best thing I could do for my wife was keep the kids for a little while so she could take a nap, and uh, so it was good. I got I got home from uh, Central Kansas. I was out with Big Kansas Outdoors, and. Uh, filming the grind waterfowl tv and, and man I got, I got home at like one o'clock in the morning thursday so just being around and present for valentine's was difficult enough but it, it was good that's awesome and like you said you are you're kind of relieved that season is over you've done more traveling than 
than the uh, usual guy does. Yeah, that's the, just the nature of it for us. I mean, we've got a lot of dogs and they need work and we need content and we've got a lot of awesome friends around the country and just trying to narrow down which trips to take. And I think I, I think I put around 38,000 miles on my truck this waterfowl season. Woo. Um, so yeah, it's quite a bit, but it's also different because I can't fly anywhere. I'm, I'm hauling a dog trailer. So I, uh, I'm, I'm limited to wherever I, I can drive to. And if I want to want to hunt and want to hang out with friends and get content and let my dog experience all different types of hunting, then just going to have to put the miles on it. So yeah, it's, it's been a great fun, you know, lots of good hunts, a few bad hunts, but overall just a fantastic and tiring waterfowl season. That's awesome. Um, I did see you, I think you were with big Kansas, but going up a few muddy Hills and I know, you know, out at Falco, there were some uh, roads that they warned us about not to take. So did you ever get stuck with that trailer behind you? Uh, very close on a trip to North Dakota with, uh, my pal Connor Neva. There's some photos that Reagan Renfro has posted and man, the truck, I'm a little bit, uh, obsessive compulsive about my truck and just always have been. So I, I'm in the wrong profession. Um, but I, like, I will, in the middle of a hunting trip, go to the car wash and wash the trailer off and wash the truck, at least just to keep mud from getting inside it anymore. And uh, we had some nasty mud and some cornfields in North Dakota, and it was it was close, but I never got it stuck. I think uh, some of my pals give me a hard time about having, you know, a lift and bigger tires and all that until they're with, you know, with me on a trip and I'm pulling a 4,000 pound dog trailer up a hill of slick mud. I'm like, see? here's here's what we do so here's why it's necessary this is why you need it i know when uh when we were out at falco and i had a headache so i was like where is the nearest gas station you know i need some tylenol and they told me which way to go and and then josh was like no you know go go just go down this road well the ruts were so deep and i'm in a rental suv and just scratching (laughs) the bottom the entire way like going through there i'm like oh my goodness i just hope nothing's broke by the time we get out of here but yeah definitely understand the uh the lifted up but All right, man. So we want to talk a little bit about, you know, the transitioning from hunting season back into training, the whole mentality, what you got going. One more quick question before we start with that, though. What's going on with that American Ninja puppy that you got in your kennel? (laughs) Yeah. So I don't know when this podcast will go up, but I'll probably wind up posting the video as a regular post for those that missed the story. But, um, man. I'm telling you. So we had this puppy. She's seven and a half weeks old. She's out of a litter of 10 puppies. Great litter. uh, Red pups, as in sired by my dog, Red. And she's the smallest in the litter. And I think what people miss is the smallest pup is she's not the runt. She has no, I think when most people say runt, they think about like small and meek and just sort of over in the corner. This puppy dominates the litter. Like she is the boss. And she's always been smaller. She doesn't care as much about eating because she's too busy, like socializing, bossing, jumping over people, like making it fun. I mean, everyone will be piling in the dog food bowl and she's running laps across the top of them. Oh and so what I think has happened is she's learned in her mental development so much that she's figured out how to, to climb. And I think a lot of puppies would figure it out at her age. But by that time, they have too much body weight to pull themselves up. And she she doesn't. So yeah, we came, we came in, I kept hearing her and Howell told me, Hey, this little puppy's escaped twice. And I was like, man, that's weird. And so we couldn't figure out how, what's going on. And then I had the guys from SOK North, Don and Wally were down with some friends. Don comes out with his pup and he's like, dude, I just walked in the puppy room and she's on top of the fence, just like perched. And I was like, what, well, how is this possible? What? So after like six times of finding her up there within 10 minutes, we stuck a camera to see what she was, you know, how she was doing it. And of course, after we made the video, we, you know, zip, we rigged it up, zip tied some plat. We tried everything. We tried put, putting like a little pole, like a broomstick through the corner. So she couldn't, and she literally climbed around the broomstick. So we ended up keeping her out, but yeah, she's a little, probably six and a half pound puppy that's scaling a five foot chain link fence and just perching and balancing on top crying for someone to come get her just waiting <laughs> that is awesome yeah, just waiting oh man yeah i saw that i was like what in the world and i know my dog when she was man she she jumped over everything kimber did not as that yep. small of a puppy but 
you know, like how your dogs get up and over everything. It was just impossible to stop it. But all right, man. So overall, how was your hunting season? Any highlights, any, you know, really cool retrieves and any dogs that really surprised you? Yeah. Great season. Uh, great hunts started out a little slow, but ended up being fantastic. I say that started out with teal season, which was super fun down in South Texas. Um, I, I think, you know, you guys did a podcast with the Falco guys. Mm-hmm. I didn't know many of them until November. And I would say those are some of my best friends after this year. I was fortunate to spend a lot of time with those guys. And I, I don't think there's anyone better in the industry. And my best retrieve, I would say, of the year was with them. I had a blind retrieve on a lesser Canada goose that sailed back behind us. And it wasn't the prettiest retrieve ever, but it was by far the, the furthest. I hate to say how far it was. Uh, Aaron, the, the guy, at, the, one of the owners at Falco who trains dogs, he was sure it was well over 600 yards. The conditions were perfect for it. It was downwind and the sun was uh, toward the, the bird. So every time Red turned around and looked at me, I was lit up with this bright morning sun. And so he could see my cast while I was using this big yellow gloves casting him and a clear sky background. So conditions were right for it with the the wind carrying the whistle. He wasn't having to fight wind, the sun, but it was, I mean, it was over there. It was a long way. And I had to walk a little bit up just to get him uh, where he could hear and see me when he was that far out on like the fourth stop. But yeah, that one was, was really cool. I had to retrieve, uh, well, I actually had a whole hunt with, um, got a whole hunt with chase white and his crew and it was a blast it was on a a ice pond that had fallen out a hole in the middle and late season geese honkers and lessers and some specs with a bunch of military veterans uh who were hunting there for free and honestly first time i can remember at least first time in a long time where the only way you could ethically hunt that spot is if you had several dogs who were capable of working in those conditions, because otherwise there's no way you could actually get the birds. And so I don't think ethically you should shoot them if you can't retrieve them, of course. And man, it was the toughest dog work I've seen. I mean, every retrieve is jumping off ice into water with a 25 mile an hour wind, choppy water, getting birds that are, you know, quickly being pushed away from you in the waves and then climbing back out of the ice with a honker. I mean, you think about a, even a, a 10 pound honker on a 55, 60 pound dog, you know, <laughs> that's like me grabbing a 30 pound weight or a 25 pound weight and crawling out of the ice with it in my mouth. You know, it's just, just crazy. Um, so that was really fun for me. And I think the most surprising thing was I, that was my first hunt with a dog that I just acquired from the UK. Who's a new stud dog at Southern Oak Kennels. And his name is Bruno. And he just crushed. I don't think he's ever seen ice, never seen decoys, never seen geese. And I was just, the trailer was close by. So I was like, worst case scenario, he doesn't adapt well to any of this. And I'll take him back to the trailer and get Kane or somebody or Maggie. But uh, I worked Red, Max, and Bruno. And Bruno probably did the brunt of the work because I just wanted to get reps with him. And uh, man, it was it was impressive to me to see how quickly. And I can't take any of the credit for that. He's just a nice dog. So uh, yeah. Overall, that's how it went. It was fun. Yeah, I mean, I was watching all those stories, and I'm like, that is pretty, you know, pretty impressive because the way the ice was, and you know, even when they're getting out, they're busting the 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 far edge of it, and then climbing up and out and getting back, and you know, yeah, they just look like they're the biggest thing a about that time. is, yeah, and it's off subject for where we want to go, but the biggest thing about that for me was, and we almost had to do this. uh, Every retrieve I sent them on, I knew that I could get to them. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest thing for me about hunting ice like that. There was an island in the middle of this thing. There was a clear, thick ice path to that island. So worst case scenario, if I had one that was struggling to climb out and I thought they'd been in the ice water too long, I could have run to the island, jumped in, pulled them out. Not that I want to, but that's kind of my rule on ice retrieves and ice water. If I don't think I can get to them within, say, 30, 45 seconds... I'm not going to send them. So, um, yeah. That's intense. So how you had three dogs running. I know you take a lot more dogs with you when you go, what, what made you stop at the three? 
just from your standpoint? The three is a lot for me to pull out. I usually like to have two dogs with me on a hunt, but I knew that it was very cold and we were in the Dakota decoy X frames and they're, they got, they got a nice dog door in the front. So I had two dogs looking out the side and, and Max who hunted on the grind all year and knows to look out that dog door. So he was looking out the door. And so we were able to hide all three. I don't think I would have been able to hide four. And, uh, those three are obviously very steady and, you know, very calm. So there wasn't a lot of jumping over one another and getting each other excited. And I was able to, if we shot a single, I could just say one name. And if multiple times we'd shoot four or five birds, I would take them one at a time, line them up, send them, make sure they were on their mark, then line the next one up, send them. And really with three, by the time you've sent the third, typically the first one's on his way back. So I wouldn't want to have four. I think it'd be overkill, but honestly, I just wanted them to kind of share the load because I know the toll it takes on a dog getting in ice water and then hopping back out. Uh, it's, it's a lot. Right. And the, the emphasis that you put on, on lines and going exactly where you want them really showed, you know, when we were out in Falco and there were some mallards that, you know, some cripples that went out in, in timber and, and you're checking the wind and, oh, he's going to hit that scent right about now. And man, direct 90 turn right to the duck, picks him up. And I was like, man, that is so awesome. Like he, yeah, <laughs> he's so, yeah I like that. The, the importance of, you know, going where you want them to go and, and the whole listening, it was, it was really, really cool to hunt with you out there. So, um, so going from those hunting situations back, transitioning into training, you know, what kind of, what are your steps besides taking a little bit of a break, you know, personally and yeah. mentally, you know, what some uh, of my dogs are going to get a break, uh, red for sure. I think he had the brunt of the load, probably a little over 500 retrieves this season and, you know, going to spend time with him doing shorter stuff. Uh, and you know, I will keep feeding him his, um, during the season diet. So in the season, uh, obviously we feed you can do the premium performance during the season. I like to feed them twice a day if I can. So I usually feed them right after a hunt. Uh, once they've, they've calmed down and their heartbeats back low. Uh, and then I'll feed them again, everyone in the evening. And then in the spring, we'll swap it all back. Once the temps start to rise, we'll swap it all back to once a day, which is better for our kennels and our dogs. And I'll keep the ones who have worked a lot and, you know, it's, it, you know, I wouldn't say they're scrawny, but it's definitely worn on them. You know, the, they've kept their weight better this year than any year I can remember, but they're definitely, you know, you can tell they're just like tired. Right. Uh, and so I'll, I'll keep them for about a month on the two a day feeding and then rotate them back off of it. Um, and basically what I like to do is keep mental notes of everything that happened that I didn't like which is easy. I'm a perfectionist and, you know, dogs are never perfect. So I, I, instead of getting angry and freaking out, I like to say, all right, well, three hunts in a row, we had this problem with like for red, for instance, it's casting into the wind. You know, this is his first year being able to really handle blind retrieves and he's done a great job. But if there's a strong cast into the wind with some distance, I know that he and I are going to have a bit of a wrestling match from the line to where he is mm -hmm. over just, Hey, you know, listen to me. I got to slow everything down. So this spring, what I'll do is just set up a ton of handling drills. Thankfully, Wally's down with me and he can oversee some of that because he's better at that than I am. But I'll set up a ton of handling drills, just casting red into the wind, building his confidence on that. Maybe it's, you know, marking the second bird. Maybe, maybe it's as simple as delivery. You know, I, I hear from people, you know, my dog comes back and by the end of the season, they were just dropping the birds at my feet and turning around looking for the next one. Well, then, you know, I would sprint, spend a few weeks cleaning that up. Whatever the, the notes I've made, whether mentally or in my phone or wherever, uh, I want to go and, and try to fix those things in the spring while the temperatures are still good for training before it gets so hot that you're just kind of going into maintenance mode. Right. Yeah, and I, I, I was wondering about that because, you know, when you're walking all of your dogs and, and thinking about what you're doing, mentally you have that in your head or, or written down i didn't notice you writing any notes when we were out hunting together but that's definitely something that you you take notice of each hunt i'm sure yeah i do i i, I mean i can't tell you every single retrieve but every time something gets messed up like hey i didn't really like that i remember it so i'm typically you know looking at wh whomever it is and saying all right here's the issue we had you know whether it's i mean they're, they're not perfect and i would say 
I think most would agree with me here. At the end of the season, your dogs look their worst, you know, especially if you've hunted hard because there's not enough time on hunts to stop and say, hey, let me work on this training issue real quick. It's, you know, hey, get back in. More birds are coming. So we're going to have to fix this later. And the dog, I mean, the best word for it is just loose. They get loose. Mm -hmm. And so things that might have been really tight in October, November, by the time you get to December, I told someone my dogs look like a bunch of feral cats out here right now. They're just (laughs) wild. You know, for instance, at the beginning of the season, when we traveled, I'd call everyone to me, have them sit right by the trailer and send them in by their name. And that was just normal behavior. And by the end of the season, I'm having to say set, you know, 40 times to one dog because they're all amped up and it just, they get loose by the end of it. So spring is my time for tightening, tightening all that back up before we roll into the hot months of summer. So speaking, speaking straight from that and, you know, any, any cornerstone members say they just went through a season, they have one dog, what should they be going back to, to start the training process again? Yeah, so I think there are a few things that are helpful with Cornerstone that we've tried to do because I, I think a lot of people will walk out into a field with their dog, with their training tools, and stand there and say to themselves, all right, what am I going to do today? Mm-hmm. And a lot of times that winds up with folks just doing the same drills they've always done, what's most comfortable, or looking at the grounds and saying, well, I can set this up and set that up. With Cornerstone, we actually provide a lesson planner and you can print it out as a PDF, and we got a video animated that shows you how to use it. And so what I would say is sit down at your computer at home or with your phone, make a list, like say, hey, top five things I need to work on with my dog, and then go download the lesson planner, and and you know everything's categorized within. So let's just say you're an intermediate gun dog. There's a category for marking. There's a category for lining. There's a category for handling, the whistle stops. Whatever it is, go there find the two to five videos that deal with that specific issue, start at the easiest ones. And I would build a whole month of lesson plans out and say, this is what we're going to do. Even if you're just training three days a week, you know, here's, here's 12 lesson plans and I'm going to work through them. And look, if we need to slow down and repeat a lesson, then I've just extended this to a, you know, a month and a week. However, however you need to do it, don't rush. But I would definitely recommend taking advantage of that because then you're, you're being intentional. You're not just walking out and saying, oh, we're going to try this today. And then you also wind up doing a whole lot less testing of your dog and a lot more training. Right. Yeah. Always having a purpose and trying to get to a certain point, you know, having those goals definitely matter. So that's a, a great point you said there. And like you said, um, you know, overall you're giving Red a rest, you know, coming out of the season that he had. Um <sighs> Is there anything to gauge, say, for guys that might be snow goose hunting right now? Is there anything that you look for that might say, okay, you hunted today, but you're definitely out of the lineup tomorrow? Yeah, some dogs can go day after day after day, and some can't. I would say weight loss, uh, easy fatigue, or a very eager dog just not really being that eager anymore uh, is a big one. And... um, just being able to read your dog, you know, red, I have to control that with red. He would go every day, all day, no matter what. So I have to slow him down, um, and take other dogs. So yeah, just keeping an eye on your dog, watching their weight. Um, again, being intentional, um, about, you know, realizing that your dog's health is more valuable than a handful of more retrieves. Especially with the snow goose season most people are having this year, you probably won't even need a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask you about that, too. You know, we're heading down to to Arkansas here at the end of the month, beginning of March, and, um, you know, it just it looks tough. It looks like everyone's yeah, having a there, tough time. Yeah, there are definitely people out there that are killing them. I mean, it can be done. It's just a lot of adults this year. I'll let you get into that with people who know more about snow geese than I do, but it seems tough from, from my perspective. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. Well, hey, man. We hit about 20 minutes. Um, that's all I said I'd keep you today. And you got some some fun to be had because you enjoy traveling so much. So you're getting on a plane here in a minute. And yep. uh, good talking to you, bud. No about. dogs. No dogs. No dogs. Finally. Easy, easy drive. Take a little break. <laughs> and that's yep. another shout out for how, right? There it is. There it is. So, so are the guys yep. the guys are down from Michigan. Are they are they down because of the cold and snow? They come down to train. Is yeah, that kind of Wally their... comes down in the spring. He'll be down for two months. He'll be down until the SOK Summit in April. So he'll be here two solid months training because we have water and they have ice. So right. 
we've got a lot of dogs that are going to be running hunt tests this year and they need water work before the tests start. So, I mean, day one, he gets there, unloads the trailer and starts doing water tea work with young pups, like off the trailer. I was like, dang, man, not even going to let him get used to smelling you know, the grass <laughs> at my house. And so, yeah, he's a beast with all that stuff. And his dogs are looking awesome. They're killing it. So he gets after he'll be it. down and uh, we'll post some stuff on Instagram about uh, our spring training. Hey, give me a quick um, SOK update on available litters. You guys are getting pushed out pretty far, right? Yeah, 2019 is sold out. I think there's maybe two or three spots we're kind of holding on to mm -hmm. for you know situations where maybe a litter doesn't work out or something. 2020, we have maybe 80% sold out, which is three male, three female pups on each litter considered sold out for us. So... Yeah, it's booked. Um, there's a little bit of room, but if you're thinking about getting a puppy in 2021, now's the time to oh, do an application on our website and the team will get with you and let you know what's available. We definitely don't have anything. Like we get a lot of calls from people and I feel awful. They're like, hey, I'm looking for a pup in the next two or three months. And I'm like, man, we just can't do it. I wish we could, but we can't do that and maintain the quality Sorry that, about that, it. We, right. yeah, that our standard is. So, Hey, I, I appreciate the time. I hope you have a, a good weekend and uh, safe travels, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. Always enjoy it, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, bud. We appreciate Barton giving us some time, and, you know, he's been incredibly uh, supportive of our show over the years, and, you know, we're happy to have him on the show doing the Yukonuba Tips of the Week and happy to have him – you know, obviously uh, supporting our show in the capacity with Cornerstone Gundog Academy. So we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be having more from Barton throughout the year. So uh, as we do kind of with our listener questions, if you guys have dog-related training questions, make sure you shoot those over to us and we will, um, you know, obviously uh, collect those up and ask him on the air. Or if you're in our Facebook group, Barton's also in there. So if you have questions about training, you can ask him in the HP group. You can go over to the Southern, Southern Oak Kennel Society group uh, or the Cornerstone page, and you can uh, you know engage with him. He's really available. That's one of the best things about that program is you can you can reach Barton and he will engage. So um, really cool to have a, a guy like him and a resource like that associated with the show. So um, yeah, I mean it must be nice to you know take your foot off the gas after a full season and. Uh, get away with no dogs for a while i can imagine <laughs> that's what i said what's it feel like driving and not uh not have the all the dogs behind you and worry about the trailer and stuff i'm sure it's a, a different feeling after a few months of that but yeah man some of those roads and you follow them on instagram you see them going uh, the amount of rain out in the central flyway and pretty much everywhere across the united states this year it was tough driving. A lot of roads closed. There's yeah. a lot of people sliding into ditches and stuff. So, so I mean, there's know. no way that if if I would have let you talk me into renting a minivan, that we would have been able to get around Kansas like we did. Yeah, we were up and off the road going through fields to get around water holes. Yeah. That was and crazy. The caravan's not going to make that. No. No, no. it's not. Mm -mm. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do we got? We got a truck for Arkansas, right? We do. We do, in fact, have a truck. So, I'm And that's wet it's wet down there, too. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm hoping uh, we're going to be flying into Memphis, so I'm hoping to be able to stop by the pyramid there at Bass Pro um, and check the pyramid out. I've seen a lot of pictures of it, and I've never been, so hopefully getting to check that box. And I'm hopefully, I, I kind of quietly hope that we might be able to make our way down to Max maybe one day and check that out, too, both of which are kind of pretty well-known spots for retail in the waterfowl space and neither one I've been to. So I'd like to, get, I'd like to check both of those boxes if I could. Yeah. And we got, um, what this episode and one more, and then the next one after that will be from Arkansas trip. And I that is correct. Yeah, maybe stopping in some of those places. Uh, the pyramid has a lot of old decoys and, and yeah. a good waterfowl section. So yep. that'll be, that'll be super neat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in retrospect, it'll be neat. <laughs> <laughs> so dumb <laughs> oh yeah so what so else what, is going on um you know not a lot for me man i know um i mean we're i'm just super busy with kids sports and stuff so our season's officially closed out here uh, kind of with my baby being born i didn't get out as much as i you know hoped to actually I, I haven't been out since um i hunted up in maryland on the torture tour so uh yeah kind of a uneventful slow ending to the season for me and so I'm looking forward to getting back out in the field 
and uh, you know going after snows for a few days. But then it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to basically be coaching baseball and, and trying to fly fish, trying to get on some trout uh, mm-hmm. here in the early spring. So that's kind of where I'm leaning. Uh, what about you? Um, yesterday, so the guys that we hunt with, um, they had a field with about 200 honkers coming into it. It was actually a flooded field and um they asked me to go and i was like oh we got to be at this banquet to set up and stuff so i'm really not trying to push the whole morning and and rush around because it'll be late night too so they said well can we borrow your floaters i said sure can come on over so (laughs) i haven't talked to them but i said you know once whenever you're done just bring them back put them over here i'll put them away and i haven't talked to them but i do know that they killed because there's quite an amount of blood on my floaters right now. So That's <laughs> and good. at least they were throwing some birds on top of them or, uh, you know, they were doing some shooting for sure. So I thought um, you were going to tell me that they shot them up. <laughs> no. Well, the one, the one is missing a head that has all the blood on it. So I'm not sure if that snapped off when it got hit or maybe it's just laying in the bag. I'm not sure, but either way, at least they got, they got a couple. Yeah. I need to, fig- I need to find out how they did though. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's been it's been tough, even you know locally. And I've uh, I've seen early framework for the Virginia seasons for next year, and it's kind of weird. It's you know doesn't start until like December, I think, for honkers in the AP zone, mm-hmm. and and it's like ten days or nine or ten days, and then there's like twenty days in January, and it's one bird a day, and I'm like, wow, that's just weird it's real it's here and then yeah and then so the other two zones in the state have, are completely unchanged same date same bag limits same everything so yeah just very strange it's and the early season still 10 correct i don't what's know the, what's the ap zone early season is it the same or is it all one? i'm pretty sure virginia is statewide 10 early season i don't hunt the ap zone in virginia ever i've That's never hunted i've never hunted it so i don't know that to be fact but I, I think, I think that's it's. I think it, the book says statewide, if I recall. Or is, is there wrong? even a? Or is it? Is there even an early season? Um, I believe we'll need, so. We'll need to fact check that. I think. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't look. I got the link. I can check it out. But, um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I didn't. I didn't have time to really kind of get into it too much. Hmm. But, you know, I was. You know, a lot of people were worried that it was going to reach outside of the AP zone and um, you know I think for the most part the resident and stuff are kind of untouched which is good I'm trying yep. to find trying to find our, uh, our Canada Goose recommendations here I don't know I don't know if the September season's in this or not oh here we go September Canada Goose the federal framework is September 1st to September 25th, and the staff recommendations are September 1st to the 25th, 10 daily, 30 in possession, hunt area statewide. Wow. Yep. Well, so, so then you fast September, forward. September's going to be getting hammered down there, yeah. especially the AP zone. You uh, fast forward to the uh, regular stuff, and the recommended for the AP is December 21st through the 29th which is nine days, and then January 11th to January 31st, one goose per day, three possession limit. But then you jump over to the uh, southern James Bay population. Regular season, we've got a a, a 12-day split, November 20th to December 1st, where you can kill three a day. Then another split for 27 days, where you can uh, from December 19th to January uh, 14th, where you can kill uh, three a day. And then January 15th to to, uh, February 15th, so a 32-day split, where you can kill five a day. And the resident population is uh, very similar, but you can kill five per day all the way through. Hmm. So November 20th through December 1st, and then December 19th through February 24th, you can kill five per day in our resident zone. So the AP zone affects very, very limited um, amount. It's mostly Southwest Virginia in the Eastern shore of Virginia. So basically everything in central Virginia to include northern Virginia is all um southern James Bay pop population. So hmm. not not it's not going to have the impact that it, uh on us that it does on Maryland for example. Right. 
but yeah, it's definitely changed. No question. So that's just crazy. Yeah. We're going to see, and you know, they were talking last night, our, our regional was talking about the Mallards going down and, you know, it was just great to see all the support from the community, even though not just the, the hunting community, but the community in general. And, um, but yeah, so we'll, it's going to be different, man, especially the Mallards. Yeah, for but sure. We'll, for sure. But the good news is there's, there's another variety of ducks, particularly if you chase divers, you know, there's other ways to fill your bag limit. So yep, there's other options, but all right, man, you got anything else you want to hit here before we close out? Well, yeah, we went, um, we went to a little painting place where you can buy an item and paint it. And I bought a really cool cup. I'll have to put the picture up on Instagram or something, but pretty much tried to paint it exactly how I look with a beard and it's actually a pretty mighty beard. So, but the color, color scheme is semi-similar so that was a fun fun little item for the family tonight but other than that i've been painting a lot the honeydew list of doors and trim in my house is all getting turned white and it is a pain in the butt Mm. well do what you gotta do brother i'm looking at that picture of you right now (laughs) this is weird oh i did uh i did have a uh, gentleman come up. Um, actually, his nephew is one of my best friends, but I, I have only met him like two or three times. He's like, man, he goes, if you ever want to go on a hunting trip, let me know. And he said, I'd like to join you and, and whatnot. And we get to talking. And, and he said he was riding up to Canada last year. And he's like, do you guys ever listen to any like books on waterfowl or you know whatever it is and oh I'm god like, he got was... you going on the audiobook thing no so he's like <laughs> <laughs> so all the guys he went with he said they're a bunch of a bunch of police officers and he said that uh, they're like yeah we listen to podcasts all the time and and i guess just a few days before that before he left he'd talked to my dad and my dad's like yeah you should check out dan's podcast you know he and his friend josh you know they're on there have a hundred some episodes and he's like oh that's neat and he's like he goes, I didn't tell your dad, but he's like, I didn't know what a podcast was. <laughs> <He> goes, <laughs> so finally, like, they're riding up there and um, they're listening to two guys talk about waterfowl the whole time. And they're like, you know, my my friend was just telling me about his son who does a podcast. And they're like, well, what's his name? And they're like, Dan Hirushka. He goes, who do you think we've been listening to the last four <laughs> hours? So, oh, man, he had me laughing pretty hard. But he's like, that's that's really cool. And at least now he knows what a podcast is. And uh yeah just the whole ride up they were listening so that was fun that was a, a fun story of the night yeah that's always a surreal a surreal feeling when you hear people um you know we've heard stories of our, some of our friends being on flights places and somehow like the hp comes up and you know it's like oh they talked to you know they listen to the show and funny stuff like that so pretty cool Pretty definitely neat. Ne- definitely neat <laughs> <laughs> all right you got anything get else you want to no, one more thing here. you want to throw on me this week no, that I think I'm done. Okay, fair enough. It's snowing here now, so. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap <laughs> this week up. I uh, do want to take a minute just again to thank Yukonuba, Gunner Kennels, and Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, which is the world's most comprehensive on- online gun dog training resource with over 160 instructional videos, including everything you need to take a seven-week-old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com, sign up for their free preview module, and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. That does it for episode 122. Hopefully you enjoyed our discussion with Barton and thought a little bit about how you might get your pup out of hunting mode and back into the off-season training mode. Now that we're in the off-season, it's a great time to catch up on past episodes. You can head over to iTunes, get all the old episodes there. You can head over to the HP Outdoors website, check out all the episodes there. You can also check out our list of discount codes that we got through a couple of our great partners to ensure you take advantage of that. And until next week, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care. Take care.